So I think I will go ahead and get started. I have a couple of introductory remarks, um, and then I hope that will allow other people to trickle down and, and find, find the room here. Um, welcome. We're really glad that you all have come out this afternoon um, on behalf of the Southern Rising Killer Whale population. I am Ruth Howell. I am the Branch Chief for Communications and External Affairs at the NOAA Fisheries West Coast Region, and I'm going to be facilitating this evening. Um, we've all been through a pretty tough couple of weeks with J35, with J50, um, and we're glad to have this opportunity. We were up in Friday Harbor last night and here today um, to come together in community for us to share um, what's been happening for us and to share our information and for us to hear from you and hear your thoughts. And so we can talk about and share um, where, where we go from here on behalf of this population. So I want to pause before we get started um, too much further to recognize that we are on ancestral tribal lands. These are the lands of the Duwamish people and uh, we have been working very closely with many of the tribes on behalf of these whales. They're important partners and we want to rec recognize and appreciate their support. Um, so I'm going to share our objectives and then talk a little bit about how, how the rest of the day, the afternoon will go um, and then I'll introduce our speakers. So, we, our objectives in being here are threefold. We want to share our emergency response approach. That was originally why we put these public meetings together. Um, we wanted to get your feedback on that. Obviously, things shifted over time, and um, J50 is, is now missing, and we are unlikely to put into effect our response approach um, this time. But we recognize that with this population, we may be in a similar situation in the future. So we want to take this opportunity to hear what you think about that approach. Um, Second, we want to share our efforts on our broader recovery for this population. We've been doing a lot over the decades, um, particularly since they were declared endangered in 2005, for salmon recovery, for, um, for contaminant, reducing contaminants, and for reducing impacts from noise. And so we want to share where we are on that. And third, we want to hear from you. That's the main and most important reason that we're here. Um, we want to hear things like what, what these whales mean to you, how the experience of J50 and J35 have changed what you do, um, you know, your experience or, or what you've been doing on behalf of these whales, thoughts about how people and whales can, can coincide and live together, and then overall thoughts on, on direction, where, where we go from here. Um, so to do that, we've got sort of a two-part agenda. First, we prepared some remarks um, to, to go over some of those big things that we wanted to share with you, our overall broader recovery, so, um, and our, our response effort for J50, and our emergency response plan. Um, we'll first hear from our Deputy Regional Administrator, Scott Rumsey, and he'll talk about the overall approach and how J50 fits into our overall approach in, in recovering this population, and also how you all can be a part of that. And Kristen Wilkinson in the middle here, she's our Washington, Oregon Stranding Coordinator, and she will speak on behalf of the J50 emergency response for the last seven weeks. And lastly, Lynn Berry, she is our uh, recovery coordinator for Southern Resident Killer Whales, and she'll go through the response approach that we developed should we have the opportunity to intervene and rescue J50 and bring her back to health. So um, after that session, we will go into public comment. So hopefully you all had a chance to sign up for public comment when you came in. We'll, um, in order to, our main goal is to hear from as many people as possible and, and to ensure that everyone who wants to get to speak will have an opportunity to speak. So we have a two minute time limit and we'll be enforcing that pretty strongly. Um, and we ask that you also respect that to respect other people's voices. So I'll go into more details about the public comment. Just know that um, please go ahead and, and sign up if, if you do want to comment. There are two other ways to comment if you don't feel comfortable speaking um, here on the microphone, and that is to submit written public comment. There, there should have been notes that were um, handed out, so please, if you would prefer to write a written comment, you can write those on the cards and turn them in at the end of the meeting. Or we have an email address specifically dedicated to this issue, which is killerwhale.help at noaa.gov. It's up here on the sign, on, on the screen there. We are always taking comments at that email address. So um, either now or any time into the future, feel free to email that address. So 
Um, let's see. I do want to point out that we've been listening to you throughout this process. We have a very active Facebook page where we've been putting up updates. We've been looking at those comments. We've been listening. We've been getting letters um, and emails directly, and we've been listening there. And we've also been listening to the response to all the media reports that have been covering this issue. So lastly, just a few logistics. I want to let everybody know that we are live streaming on Facebook this event. Alan Rahi right here will be moving around to get the good shot because we know that not everybody who cares about this issue can be here in person. And so I think we have a number of followers already. We had a lot of people following and, and listening in uh, last night as well. So that's happening. The restrooms, if you need them, are around the corner. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Scott Rumsey, our Deputy Regional Administrator. Thank you. Am I live, Scott? Can you hear me? Okay, great. Um, well, thank you all for being here. I really do want to recognize um, that you all took time out of your personal lives and your busy weekends and even your families to be here. I'm glad to see that some people brought their families with them. Um, you know, we're, we're all here because we care deeply about J50. We care deeply about Southern resident killer whales. Um, and uh, it, it fills me with a lot of optimism to see so many people in this room that care so deeply about the same subject. Um, you know, if we are going to recover Southern resident killer whales, it's going to take the entire community of the Sailor Sea, and we're going to need to work together. Uh, you know, have civil discourse and work together in partnership to to recover killer whales. You know, there's no single silver bullet. Um, it's a really complex issue. It's going to take all of us um, working together. Um, so as, as, as Ruth indicated, we wish we were here under uh, brighter circumstances. Um, we had hoped that we would come here and, and share with you our proposed response plan for J50 and, and solicit your input. Um, and, and as I think you're all aware, J50 has not been seen since last Saturday off of uh, the Fraser River. And, and since then, her family has been seen on a couple of instances without her. So, you know, I, I think we're all um, pretty sad about that and, and fearing the worst. Um, you know, I do want to acknowledge that we have uh, been really lucky and all the resources and assets since then that have been thrown at um, searching uh, via air and water for, for J50. Um, so, you know, I, I still hold out hope, but I, I know it doesn't look, um, doesn't look so good. Um, so, you know, why are we here? We've touched on it. You know, we, we still want to hear your thoughts on the appropriate considerations in intervening with um, a sick killer whale in the wild. Um, you know, this is an unprecedented challenge of, of having to, to deal with and possibly administer medical care to a killer whale in the wild. Um, and, you know, really along the way, we, we had to make up our plan on the fly. Um, we brought in the world's experts. Um, with one goal in mind, which was the well-being of J50 and the uh, Southern resident killer whales. Uh, you know, I, I do want to make clear that our overarching philosophy in considering whether to intervene was one, the goal of having J50 be a contributing and reproductive member of her population in the wild. Um, and also a do no harm philosophy. You know, we recognize that any level of intervention um, can disturb her pod and her population. And we did not want to intervene in such a way that it would disturb the behavior or disrupt the really important family bonds um, of her pod or the southern resident killer whales um, um, uh, at large. Um, so, you know, we, we may find ourselves in this, this situation again. Um, and so it is really important to us to hear your input um, as we develop a plan um, and, and hopefully proactively can develop a plan and, and consider your input if, if this happens again. 
Um, and of course, I'm really interested in hearing your input on Southern Resident Kill Oil recovery in general. Um, you know, as I, as I mentioned, um, it's, it's a really complex problem, but clearly uh, we're not doing enough. The whales are not doing well. They're continuing to decline. Um, you know, I, I, I view the, the plight of the southern resident killer whales really as a canary in the coal mine. I mean, the, the Puget Sound ecosystem is really sick, and the whales are suffering from that. Um, and we collectively, we all need to do more to recover the ecosystem and support killer whales. Um, you know, I, I do want to acknowledge that, you know, over the past decade and more, you know, we have done a lot to, uh, to help recover killer whales. I mean, I acknowledge it hasn't been enough, but um, I want to note some of those things. We've made critical investments in research so that our recovery approach is informed by science, I mean that is, um, you know, as a scientific agency, that's absolutely critical. Uh, through the Pacific Coastal Salmon Recovery Fund, um, over the past almost two decades now, we've invested um, over a billion dollars in um, in to salmon habitat restoration, and our partners have nearly matched that billion dollars. Um, we've reduced harvest domestically and in. Um, <coughs> international negotiations with CAMDA. You know, at the same time, we've tried to maintain the hatchery production of salmon um, to be available for killer whales and, and our tribal trust and treaty obligations and fisheries, um, but consistent with salmon recovery. We feel that the, the most sustainable future for salmon and killer whales are, are naturally viable wild salmon populations. Um, uh, we, you know, I've mentioned partnerships. It really is all about partnerships. We've partnered with the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife um, on enforcement. We have an important enforcement presence on the water. Um, we have partners that are involved in on the water and off the water education of boaters and anglers. Um, we have instituted vessel approach regulations. Uh, to minimize the disturbance of, of, of whales as they forage and, and go about um, their behavior. Uh, the Environmental Protection Agency and Washington Ecology are struggling with that really huge problem, which is how to deal with contamination in the Puget Sound ecosystem. Um, and this year, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, the Whale Watchers, San Juan County, instituted a voluntary vessel closure area. Um, really trying to get at making sure that where the whales are, they have, uh, they're undisturbed in, in trying to, to forage and, and go about their normal behavior. Uh, governor's in, Governor Inslee established the Killer Whale Task Force. I know there's some strong views about this task force, but it is providing a venue for some really important discussions um, to be had. And it's also providing some uh, important technical products that I think would be helpful in allowing us to focus our resources on those salmon populations and uh, those elements that will have the best, the best thing for the buck for the killer whales. Um, there's a lot of uh, a lot of discussion about breaching the Snake River dams, um, and I know there's a lot of uh, interest there. Uh, you know, frankly, NOAA does not have the regulatory authority to breach those dams, but there is a rigorous analysis being done right now uh, through the Bonneville Power Administration and the Army Corps of Engineers to evaluate scenarios of removing one or more dams. Um, so I think those who are really interested in, in that factor, I encourage you to engage in that process for sure. Um, so there, there's a lot going on, but again, I acknowledge that it isn't enough. Um, um, and it has not been enough, and we need to do more. And, you know, I think we all need to reflect, not only in our jobs, but personally, what can we do to contribute to recovering the Puget Sound ecosystem and helping the killer whales. Um, you know, as we move into uh, uh, Christian and Lynn doing their talks and um, hearing public comment, um, 
you know, again, I want us all to remember that we're all here for um, at least one reason, and that is how much we care about the killer whales and recovering the killer whales. Um, I think it's really important that, you know, we recognize that noble intent. Everyone is here for that same purpose, and let's respect people and their views um, and make sure everyone can be heard about that. That is why I'm here today. I really want to be, I want to understand everyone's perspectives and, and I hope we can all share that respect with, with everyone else in the room. Um, and then in, in closing, I'll, I'll recognize that the public comment component is a little awkward. Um, you know, we want to make sure everyone has a chance to be heard. Um, you know, it's hard for us to not engage in the dialogue, but we simply don't have the time to do that today. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure that everyone has the opportunity um, to speak. Um, you know, afterwards, I hope to be able to, to talk to some of you individually. Um, but again, let's, let's recognize and respect letting everyone have a chance to hear it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Scott. And thank you, Dr. Hoffman, for coming out today. Um, I know I'm sitting at this table because I have been a lifelong lover of marine mammals and I've dedicated my entire career to their conservation. So while this is not the outcome that we had hoped or that we had planned for, I believe that we can learn from this experience and really make a difference in the future. So today I'll provide a short summary of how this all unfolded and let you know what information guided NOAA's decisions along the way. So we all knew J50 as a three and a half year old female that was a very valuable member of JPOM that had the potential to help recover this critically endangered population. In late July, aerial photogrammetry images were shared with us that showed that J50's body condition was declining. And in August, our research partners um, and others in the water let us know that her behavior was changing, um, that she was um, lethargic and lagging behind her pod. And when this type of behavior and information is brought to our attention, we convene a consultation team um, led by NOAA to bring uh, technical expertise in a variety of arenas to the discussion. This team is comprised of biologists, uh, marine mammal researchers, veterinarians, pathologists, all getting together to discuss what information we have and what do we need to learn to make an informed decision. So our team includes nonprofits, state and government agencies, and our West Coast Marine Mammal Stranding Network partners. It also included counterparts in Canada we know the whales cross over into Canadian waters very regularly. So we engaged with our counterparts in Canada and began to develop a transboundary plan so that border wouldn't limit our ability to respond to her in need. Uh, I would recommend all of you go to our website and look at a comprehensive list of all of the partners that were engaged in this incredible effort. So we know many of you have concerns about SeaWorld being involved in this response. We know um, they have been long-standing Marine Mammal Stranding Network partners because of the significant expertise they have in stranding, rehabilitation, and entanglement response. All of our, our partners are selected by their expertise and their expertise only. And they are working directly with us so NOAA can make the best decision in the interest of the whales. So this consultation team suggested to NOAA that we prioritize collecting fecal and breath samples to help inform a diagnosis of J50's condition. The veterinarians recommended providing medical treatment in the form of an antibiotic and dewormer. On August 9th and September 4th, veterinarians administered medical treatment to J50. And on August 12th, with the support of the Lummi tribe, we conducted an experimental uh, tool trial to see if we could deliver oral medication to J50. 
She did not show interest uh, in the fish released into her path. This effort was never intended to feed J50 or any member of her pod. We know and recognize that this is not a sustainable approach or a feasible way to recover this population. Despite taking all of these steps, um, J50 continued to decline in condition, and as we all now know, she is missing from the population. We've spent two days with a dedicated aerial and on-water search, and the response team has now left uh, San Juan Island. This has been a very challenging and complex case, but it has brought an incredible group of researchers and partners and this community together to have a very important conversation. This would not have been possible without the support and the collaboration of our partners. We sincerely thank you for your partnership and the expertise you've brought. Our next steps are to debrief with our team and also internally. And I'll finally get to write that, that final plan, that final logistics plan, so we can be better prepared for a case like this in the future. Thank you, and I'll now turn it over to Lynn Berry, my colleague, to speak about our response approach. Yeah, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, so I, I serve as NOAA's recovery coordinator for endangered southern resident killer whales. I've been working on this for, for 15 years. And during that time, like we've learned so much about these whales through our long-term uh, studies that have been going on, understanding the whales, through new like really innovative um, research techniques and, and developments in things like conservation medicine. And we've, we've made progress. As Scott mentioned, some of the actions we've implemented, some of the things we've done. But we know we haven't done enough and, and we need to do more. And we've also witnessed some really tragic experiences during this time, loss of individuals, what we've gone through this summer with J35, who is the female carrying her dead calf, and now with J50 and just her declining condition. Uh, it's really touched all of us and, and brought to light that this is an opportunity where we have so much interest, so much uh, compassion for these whales, and I'm hopeful that that will help support the really difficult and bold actions that need to be taken to uh, help these whales. So I, again, I want to stress that our, we very much hoped to help J50. Our goal was to try to provide her with some medical treatment to improve her condition and for, to reach our overall goal, which was to have her be just a functioning, productive member of this amazing population of really social animals. And Despite her loss, we're conscious of the fact that this type of situation could come up again. And so we really do want to hear from you. Your feedback's important to us to help understand kind of what our approach has been, how we're making decisions, and how we move forward from here. First and foremost, our objective was for J50 to survive in the wild, ultimately contribute to recovery of this population. And we really appreciate all the input we've received from our expert consultation team, these international uh, colleagues of ours with so much wealth of experience, what we've heard from all of our partners through this process and also uh, from the public. And so in any rescue, again, our kind of most important priority is for an animal to remain in the wild with their population, with their family group. Captivity was never an intention as part of this rescue operation and our planning. In fact, uh, you know, permanent captivity is something we very much want to avoid as it's not consistent with our overall goal to have these animals wild in their population and, and, and doing what they do that we care so much about. And so any kind of uh, rescue situation or, or compromised animals is gonna have a lot of variability and, and things we need to consider. So I just wanna walk through some of the options that we are considering and preparing for as part of this response for J50 and to inform you know, what we might do in the, in the future. Some of the considerations and some of our decision points for NOAA. So the first stage of any rescue operation would be assessing that situation in real time. What was a separation between J50 and her family group? Was it safe 
for us to attempt a rescue, uh, safe for an individual like J50, safe for her family, making sure we aren't causing more harm than the good we're trying to do, and also making sure it's safe for our team that's conducting the rescue. And unfortunately, in this case, J50's condition was really this trigger, letting us know that her body condition had declined severely. It was a life-threatening situation, and we wanted to see what we could do. We were monitoring her presence, her movements, and her connectivity with her mother, J16, and her whole family group. And as, as mentioned, those last sightings of, of her, she was still with her mother, J16. They were still in a close family group, and so we did not intervene. If the situation had been different and she was stranded on a beach or alone and really struggling in that life-threatening situation, um, the next steps for a rescue would have been to, to capture her, to catch her and see if we could bring her into our care, and the first step would be to do a physical health assessment. It would be rapid but really thorough to learn as much as we can about our condition. Uh, we can collect samples and do amazing tests in real time, understanding blood parameters, doing ultrasounds, taking feces, just understanding her condition. And that could help us understand what might be underlying this really poor body condition we're seeing and that emaciated condition. And all the information from that physical health assessment would uh, allow Noah to make a decision about how to move forward. And it would be, you know, of course, a really difficult decision. If we thought that she had a, a condition that we couldn't treat, that uh, medical care would, wouldn't be able to help her improve her chances of survival in the wild, we have an option in front of us to return her to her family immediately. You know, so we'd want to be knowing what the situation is, where, how, what is that separation on that transport boat where we're doing a physical health assessment, could we be, you know, moving toward if her family was in a distant location, and as Kristen mentioned, like across the border, so we have a, a fluid way to return her to her family to perhaps live out the rest of her days. But if we did find a, a condition we could treat, and there's been so many great advancements in medical care of these animals, and we have so many helpful uh, veterinarians and experts helping us. Um, we looked for an opportunity, can we do short-term rehabilitation and care? So Noah has a, a lab facility at Manchester near Port Orchard, Washington, and to, to provide for that opportunity to provide medical treatment and rehabilitation and care, we identified a, a net pen there. We also had a kind of temporary above ground pool where we could stabilize her condition, then move her into this net pen and care for her to improve her chances of survival in the wild so we could return her to her family and she could be that productive member of the population that we all want to see. That care and rehabilitation would be done very carefully and in a way that would not detract from her ability to survive in the wild. Keeping that distance so she doesn't become habituated to people or dependent on people for food and for care. So just maintaining her, keeping her wild and having that opportunity to put her back with her family. So that would also be that decision point to, based on how her condition improved, what we were able to provide for her as medical treatment, what we found about her underlying condition, and then all of that uh, information and, and experts from our consultation team who could provide that information to us and NOAA and DFO, our de colleagues, Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada, would find the way to return her to her family in the best way for her as well as for the, you know, having the least amount of disturbance on her family group. So those are our overarching philosophies and goals with a response. Now I know, uh, you know, we've heard from many people who think we didn't do enough and we didn't act quickly enough. Uh, but we've also heard from others who feel like, you know, we did too much. And that what I've just laid out as some of our options for a response would be, you know, going too far for some people. And so, you know, the approach we've taken based on the science, based on our past experience and all of the expert information and what we would learn each step of the way to make those decisions. Um, you know, your feedback is a part of that as well. So we really do want to hear from you about this situation, about our approach. Um, and also, uh, we want to hear 
your input on moving forward with protecting and conserving our ecosystem um, and those salmon that are so vital to our region and really all of that for the ultimate goal we're here to support which is recovery of those southern resident killer whales that are just such amazing animals and that we all really care so much about. So thank you very much for coming today and for, for giving us your thoughts. Thank you all. Um, so now you've heard from us at NOAA Fisheries um, and we wanna turn and um, hear from those of you um, who'd like to speak publicly and a reminder that um, you can provide us written comments and um, also email comments into the email address up on the screen there. Um, to, just to give an overview of how this is gonna run, we want, as I mentioned before, we wanna make sure that everybody who wants to speak has an opportunity to speak. So everybody will have two minutes and um, Forbes Darby here is our timekeeper. And actually Forbes, do you mind sitting in the chair? Is there a chair over there? I think that'll be closer. Let's do that. So Forbes has a timer. I'm making him do two things at once, both show you the timer and move. Um, but there'll be a timer that will count down from two minutes and we'll give you go yellow when you're about done and then we'll start counting up when, when the time is, time is up. So um, we appreciate you sticking to that time. Um, I will call up two individuals to, to speak at a time so that the next individual can stand behind um, the first person to speak. Um, and just a couple of requests when you do come up to speak, if you could begin by stating your name, um, limit you know, your remarks to two minutes, I think I mentioned that already, um, and as Scott mentioned, remain respectful of the diverse viewpoints. This is a really challenging issue and there's a lot of different points of view and if you would um, you know, respect, respect others' points of view. Um, we will be documenting this in a number of ways. So we have a note taker here, Hannah Melman, who will be taking notes um, and capturing what, what you have to say. Obviously we have a number of cameras um, here. I mentioned our live Facebook streaming, Seattle Channel is recording as well and we'll be broadcasting this at a later date. Um, and uh, we have, I think we have an audio recording. Last night we had an audio recording. So. Um, we, we will make sure to, to um, compile and, and share all of your comments. So, um, let's see. Oh, I did want to, to point out that, um, as Scott mentioned, unfortunately we won't be able to answer questions directly. If you do have very specific questions, put those on the written comment cards and we will get back to you, add your email address there. Um, but because of, of time limitations, we won't be able to um, directly uh, address questions. So, with that, um, I'm gonna, call out the first two speakers, if you would come on up. Um, the first speaker is uh, Pepe Beth Batun, or Bethune, and the second speaker is uh, Sherry or Shari Tarantino. Right. And Pepe, if you would start with, well, start with your name. Uh, my name is Captain Pete Bethune, and I work on marine conservation in different parts of the world. I have a television show, uh, The Operatives, that uh, covers marine conservation issues. Um, it's quite sad that I'm here in the States, the most powerful country on earth, one of the wealthiest countries on earth, and we have an orca, orca population that is in steep decline. And really it goes back to the point made earlier about an ecosystem that is out of balance. Now I'm going to take you very briefly back through history. What happened here in the, a century ago was the pinnipeds were largely wiped out of P Puget Sound. This is the seals and the sea lions. Now something I want to nip in the butt. On Friday, there were some posts from fishermen saying that the problem here is the pinnipeds eating too many of the Chinook salmon. Now it does happen that Chinook salmon, the sea lion especially, will eat a lot of them. But here's what's happened. By wiping out the pinnipeds, uh, for a period, you've probably got a huge salmon population here. America's wiped out the great white sharks. They've taken away the predators for the, um, for the pinnipeds. Then you've, you've gone and taken orca out of here, many of them that ended up in SeaWorld and places like this. I find it ironic now that SeaWorld is back here assisting on this, and yet they were part of the original problem in reducing J-Pod in the first place. Um, so you've gone and wipe, wiped out the predators for the seals. Now the seals are bouncing back. It's a success story. It should be celebrated. The, this notion of going and moving pinnipeds, which the fishermen are starting to, to talk about, is a nonsense. You're gonna go and create a problem somewhere else. 
The problem here is you've been messing with the ecosystem too long and in many ways with J35 and J50, it's a band-aid measure in the short term. In the long term here, there needs to be a fundamental shift in how you go approaching Puget Sound and it needs a government with backbone and it needs money to be put in. And I'm, I'm saddened about America. <laughs> America, you know, a country with so much wealth and so much money. I work in Africa, Asia, all these countries that have zero money, and this country can't go do it. You're rolling back all of your environmental laws. I hope that the government and the rest of you can step up and sort this out. And there'll be other scientists and learner people who come in and talk about the individual measures. I see you've gone over time. Thank yeah. you. I think it's Zach Windham. Please stand behind me, Shari. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Never mind. No? Okay. Um, next then is Mena Vermeer. I just want to say thank you for giving us the opportunity to speak today. My name is Sherry Tarantino. I'm with Orca Conservancy. Uh, Orca Conservancy played a leading role in the effort to rescue A73, along with a coalition of other groups that created the Orphan Orca Fund in 2002. Although J50 was obviously ailing for months, we do feel Noah did not use all the means at his disposal to save her life. That said, we all need to be aware that such intervention is a learning experience rather than a population recovery step for a food limited population. Even if J50 had been returned to the wild, she would have competed with other whales for food. And if we want, res if we want rescued southern residents to contribute to population recovery as A73 has done for the northern residents, and even the Barnes Lake whales did for the offshores, we need to take significant action to aid southern residents as a whole. Actions that can be taken to increase prey ability include dam removal, culvert replacement, restoration of freshwater spawning habitat and rearing habitat in both fresh and salt water, increasing hatchery production where appropriate, and phasing it out as wild runs improve. Removing artificial barriers to migration that make salmon vulnerable to other predators and improved regulation and compliance with rules for habitat protection. The issues facing this population should dishearten those who argued that we should let nature take its course with J50. Since the middle of the 19th century, when we started destroying spawning habitat to pan for gold, blocking access to spawning habitat with dams, reducing salmon populations with overfishing, made possible by canning process and degrading the habitat with logging, agricultural and rural development, development, excuse me, nature has been losing its power to take its course. More of nature's park was taken away in the middle of the 20th century when toxic chemicals like DDT and PCBs were unleashed to impair immune systems and disrupt normal fetal development of this population. The noise added to the Salish Sea in the late 20th century and early 21st century has made nature even less relevant. Without action to improve the habitat of the southern residents throughout their entire range, how we respond to individuals in distress will affect individuals with strong will to live and whose deaths would be mourned by their companions, but it won't help us recover the population. Thank you. Following Mana is Christine Caruso, if you could come up. Hi, my name is Maria Vermeer. I'm, I'm not part of any organization, I'm just a citizen, and um, I was born here. We went sailing when I was a child. We looked as hard as we could for orcas on every ferry ride and every sailboat ride with my grandfather. Gosh, we never saw him. Oh, someday. <laughs> but, um, you know, I just, um, this one hit me. My daughter is three and a half years old. She was born probably about two weeks. Um, apart from J50, also had just a crazy labor. Sounds like J50 did too. And I just kept reading these news reports, checking your site every day, and I was like, oh my gosh, the words they used to describe this little thing, funky or spunky and, and, um, and a little fighter, and it's just all the words we used to describe my daughter. So anthropomorphize anthropomorph or whatever the word is, it's, it just hit me for some reason. And, and, and I just wanna say that um, you know, from my desktop, I felt like I couldn't do anything. So I really appreciate what you guys have done. And, and I'm such a firm believer in do what you can when you can. And I would really encourage everybody to just turn up the dial a bit. It, it's clearly a crisis. And, and I'm sitting here from my home. I, I married someone who has a farm in the Columbia Basin. Um, I also married someone who is a sport fisherman and who has many friends who are sport fishermen. I can say that um, 
you know, we all have different opinions about things, but the sport fishermen I know sure respect whatever regulations are in place. So if the regulations uh, get a little bit stricter, it seems like the people I know would follow it. Um, I don't, I don't know what the answer is here, but I sure, I sure hope that my kids and their grandkids and their kids um, can look for orcas when they sell and, and go on ferries, and, and I really appreciate what you've done. Thank you. Following Christine is Jeff Rash, if you would come up to the front. Hi, um, so it was devastating to watch J35 carry her dead baby for 17 long days as the baby slowly deterior deteriorated before our eyes and more recently to watch J50 slowly die as the world watched as well. We cannot sit back and watch our southern residents go extinct. We need to take bold actions, immediate and long term, to restore ecosystems and salmon habitat in a multitude of ways getting rid of net pen farmed salmon to protect our wild salmon, tear down dams, stop fishing for and eating salmon, voting for like-minded politicians, having no boat zones. Noah, please, you need to be more transparent. If you have been thinking about capturing J50 to rehab her and have been preparing a sea pen in Manchester for months, why was it only public knowledge in the past few days? Please let us know what you are doing. If the norm is going to be to capture and rehab sick and dying orcas, if they cannot be released, the orcas need to stay in the ocean with absolutely no plans for them to be put in a concrete tank at SeaWorld, Vancouver Aquarium, or anywhere else. If SeaWorld is partnering with you, I would like for SeaWorld to build a permanent sea sanctuary for orcas who cannot be released. And if they are released and their families don't accept them back for some reason, they can live out their entire lives in the ocean under human care. It would be a win-win for them as well as the orcas. Thank you. Jeff Rash is up next, and after that is Sally King, if you'll come to the front. I just have a, <clears throat> excuse me, a couple questions I'd like to address. Um, I've read some of the necropsy reports on the marine mammals that pass away in Puget Sound. I've looked at the toxin levels that those tissue samples contained. This is not just an orca problem, this is a sailor sea problem. Uh, we gotta start looking at what we're doing with these toxins. I mean, they're in the groundwater, they're in different plants, they're probably in some of the food we eat. So that needs to also kind of be addressed to the public to let them know how, if any way, that's harming our orcas and how it's getting to them and see if this can be solved in some way. I know it may take a while, that's why it's gotta be looked at very seriously now. And another question I have is, are there any other orcas out there in three, any three of the pods that are kind of in the same condition that J50 is? I know there's a lot of people out there looking at them do they have an idea now of the health of maybe some of those orcas that don't look great, that things may start being looked at and, and kind of investigated now instead of waiting until it's too late? And that's where bringing different agencies together, bringing different toxicologists together, histopath, pathologists, to look at the whole environment and see what is going on in Puget Sound and how we can help it. up next and if, if Karina Makowski would come to the front. Hi, uh, my name is Sally King. Uh, a lot of you know that I was passing out these uh, bracelets um, when you came in. They say J35 salmon equals survival. Um, when J J35 was pushing her calf around I was so heartbroken I could barely read the reports but then it dawned on me that she was sending a message and finally I thought of something that I could do. So while she was still carrying her calf, I had these bracelets made. Uh, so far, I've um, passed out about 500 of them. I've, my, my reach is very small. Um, I'm trying to get this thing to go viral, to raise awareness that something must be done. Certainly, uh, contaminants and uh, disturbances are important, but if they don't have enough to eat, those other uh, solutions will 
be pointless. So what I'm trying to do is uh, get, get this out. I think it's a way for the general public to um, become more aware. And we need to bring pressure on the organizations that can do um, things immediately to restore salmon habitat. So um, this is sort of a call to action, and I am looking for anyone who can help me make these more available. I need an e-commerce site to uh, make these available on. I've talked to some journalists who are willing to tweet about it, but people need to have a place to go for uh, in order to get these. Um, so if uh, I, I passed out pieces of paper, I have an email address, project, j35 at gmail.com and I have a Facebook page project j35 so please get in touch with me if you have any ideas on how I can get this going thank you thank you following Karina Makowski who's next Michelle McClellan please come up to the front my name is Karina McCaskey. I do a lot of volunteer video work for a lot of cetacean-related events in the area. I just have this to say. This problem with our local whales has to be addressed on a population and an ecosystem level. By the time we're focused on an individual, it's too late. We've got the information. These whales need food. We've had an expert, Ken Balcom, and those at the Center for Whale Research, who have studied these whales for decades, and they've been raising the alarm for years. There are other issues, yes, but food is central. Food, or the lack thereof, leads to failed pregnancies, stored toxins being burned from shrinking blubber reserves, and immunosuppression. Nothing can thrive without food. We must address the expert identified fastest long-term help available to these whales, breaching the lower Snake River dams. If we can't all come together and even take one big bold action, that one, and to save this iconic, well-loved, well-studied species, what hope does any endangered animal have anywhere around the world? Thank you. Is this working? Michelle McClellan is next, and Diane Freeman, please come up. Okay, so I guess I don't need to say my name then. <laughs> Michelle McClellan. Um, I don't have any new science to share um, or any insight that everyone here doesn't already have. Um, I was born in the Seattle area and grew up here. Both my parents graduated from the University of Washington, so Puget Sound was always our backyard. And I live in Portland now, and I drove up this morning to be here, and I want you all to know that I'm representing dozens, if not hundreds, of my friends in Portland who are in anguish over the situation. <laughs> So Scott, you uh, invited us to talk about how this is affecting us personally. So I'm gonna get real personal here, so strap yourselves in. Um, when I first heard about Taliqua, is that how you pronounce it? Taliqua, or uh, J35, I was actually up here visiting my aunt and uncle, and uh, when somebody, Lynn Mapes has been covering this, someone was quoted as saying that she was not just grieving, but communicating. Um, Everything I've read and learned is that these whales are starving to death. So, um, in my anguish, I'm a, a, a sound mind and body. I'm a professional woman. I, you know, I'm a contributing member of my community. I'm not a wacko, but <laughs> believe me. But for probably two days, I literally fantasized about parking myself on a public dock in Seattle or Bellingham or Port Townsend or somewhere, and engaging in a hunger strike. For two days, I was plagued with that fantasy. I got so far that I thought, if they drag me off to jail, which they probably will, I'm gonna, I'm gonna continue to this hunger strike in prison. I am tired of the human race putting ourselves above every other non-human being on this planet, and it's got to stop. So there you go. <laughs> Tried to stay civil, but I'm a little upset. Diane Freeman is next, and then Sandy Wright, if you please come up. You guys like my new name, Diane? <laughs> okay, no, my wife asked me to speak today. 
there's this isn't a, a simple problem and there's no simple solution for it Scott I gotta agree with you you hit the nail on the head because my wife and I've been talking about this for quite some time there is no silver bullet to fix this you you have a compound problem with the whales one you got a closed circuit as far as the reproduction you have a food problem you have pesticides and you have noise that all goes into place into this problem with the whales how do we fix it it's going to take all of us. It's not going to take the government agency to run it. If you put that in charge, then you may get what you want. You may not get what you want. It all depends on how much input you have in this program. But the bottom line is all of us in this room contacting all the people that we deal with in our lives and in our inner circles. So how do we do it? Do we deal with the salmon? Do we deal with the noise? Do we deal with the population? How do you fix this? Is there a solution for the reproduction? Because in this closed circuit reproduction system that these guys have created for themselves, and now they even take it a little bit further, they have a closed segment of what they actually eat, which is the Chinook salmon. So do you start artificial insemination on the whales? Do you do something like that? Do you capture a few and try to reintroduce some more genetics in this? Because this genetic pool is pretty small at this point on these whales. I don't know. I don't have a, a, a simple answer for you. All I can say is that for me personally, you know, I'll take a, a step toward eating salmon. I'll take a step toward whale watching. I'll take a step for, you know, soliciting out and helping other people and, and doing what I can for public education. I will do what I can to help extend what I know out to other people so that we can all get on the same page and deal with this problem. Because if we don't, it's what we've all come to a conclusion in this room this day, and as we will see this pod, or a couple of these pods, disappear. Sandy Wright is next, and Erica Hansen, if you'd come up to the front. Hi, I just have a few points I wanted to make. Um, first, I would like to say Noah has a huge credibility problem when it comes to the Southern residents. Like lots of people have said, there's been no for over a decade that they don't have enough food and honestly we haven't seen anything happen but more whales dying. Um, it has now become apparent that SeaWorld's involved once again with the Southern residents. And I just want to say that if Noah thinks or SeaWorld thinks that the people of Washington State have forgotten what they did to this population of whales, they are in for a huge surprise. Um, we will not be silent while SeaWorld tries to repair their ruined reputation by once again using the Southern residents for their own selfish greed. Um, SeaWorld was kicked out of Washington State once and we will do it again if we have to. Um, I am seriously hoping whatever role SeaWorld is playing, um, Noah will strongly reconsider whatever ill-conceived idea came up with to allow them to have any part of this. Thank you. Erica Hansen is up next, and Jim Wright, would you please come up? Hello, my name is Erica Hansen. I originally had no intention of speaking. However, after having attended the meeting in Friday Harbor last evening, I felt compelled to do so. I have no doubt that you love these animals. Um, and while I appreciate that, it became clear to me last night that the bur bureaucracy of this organization is killing our whales as swiftly as the lack of salmon. You said in the introduction that the recovery of J50 was done, quote unquote, on the fly. And I personally believe that's not true. We've been faced with the decline of these animals for so many years. This is hardly a surprise. Um, the format, this format, doesn't really help. I appreciate the opportunity to speak. However, vague action plans, steadfast re refusal to respond to our questions, isn't feeding the whales. Forming committee after committee after committee and talking is not feeding the whales. You keep saying that this issue is complicated, but I honestly believe that you are confusing the word complicated with political. <laughs> <laughs> Actions speak louder than words, and right now we need to be shouting at the top of our lungs. Feed the darn whales. Lastly, in response to um, the Facebook page having stated that SeaWorld would be represented here, I just have to say to those individuals, if you happen to be here, you have a lot of nerves showing up here. <laughs> the blood of these animals is very much on your hands. And if you think that your, your, these promises that you're making are nothing more than thinly veiled ulterior motives, think again. None of us have forgotten what you did to this population. 
If I had my way, there would be a hundred mile restraining order between you and these animals. Yeah. After Jim Wright is Anna Gillickson, if you'd come up to the front. Hi everybody. I'm gonna build a little bit on what the last two speakers said. And I'll say that I am not, my profession has nothing to do with whales. Um, my passion has everything to do with whales and other animals. And I just have two points to make. The first point is, the science is in as far as what has to happen with these whales. We do not need to do more research. Mm -hmm. um, Ken Malcolm has been preaching for 20 years now that we need more salmon. Yeah. I will say too that the toxins matter too and that's a great long-term solution. But we also know that if they had enough food, the toxins would not be impacting them right now. We look at the transient killer whales that live here and they're thriving with the same toxins. Now, point two, gotta talk about SeaWorld. As you probably know, SeaWorld's entire history with orcas has to do with ripping them from their families or breeding them in captivity and committing them to a life sentence in captivity and as they do this, their treatment of the orcas disregards all of the science that out there, out there, which I believe there's a person in the room who's done a large part of this science, that tells us that these animals have emotional capabilities and complexity that's probably tops in the animal kingdom. That includes us. Despite that, we do things that are horrific to them. We rip them apart from their families. It scares me that SeaWorld might be involved with NOAA. It scares me that they're talking about taking J-50 I don't trust entirely what's being said. I believe that there's some plans in place to take these animals from the wild, and it really, really scares me that that might happen. I would strongly encourage everybody out here to take steps that are bigger than our standard steps. If you're like me, you probably do social media posts. You may go to protests. I've been fortunate enough to go to conferences and, and meet some of the wonderful whale researchers that are out there in the world. We need to do more. If they take steps to harass these orcas or remove them from the waters, we need to fight. Thank yeah. you. Anna Gullickson is next, and following her is Greg Dandelis, if you'd come up. Hello, my name is Anna Gullickson. I'm with Wild Orca. And I'd like to say that the killer whales have been on this planet for roughly 11 million years. And just in the last 48 years, we have seen them um, go from the captures with SeaWorld to being listed as endangered and now are, they are potentially at the brink of their extinction. <laughs> so from 11 million years in the last 48, we can see that we're probably the issue here, right? So these are the most studied whales in the entire world, the southern resident killer whales are. And I would just um, like to ask what's been done with all this info? Like we spend all these resources and time and money to study these whales. What's really been done and I mean on a big basis. There's been the vessel distance that you've done and the critical habitat areas, but um, what have we really done to try and help this species? <laughs> Capturing them on a triage basis is not the answer to these whales. Um, what are we going to do tomorrow, next week, next month, next year to actually save this species? Um, orcas and seals need salmon to survive. Humans do not need salmon to survive. We actually don't need salmon to be healthy. Um, so why are we not banning fishing and subsidizing the fisheries? Why do we not have sanctuary spaces where whales can forage on their own and not be bothered by vessels and have spaces to be um, free? Why have you reached out to SeaWorld so for support and not um, local funding and local support? Why have we reached out to SeaWorld for this? And if we can't provide an environment where these whales can live naturally and healthily, then why are we even bothering about this other stuff. If we can't give them the environment to survive in, then why bother? So for once, can we put the whale's best interests before each and every one of our own? Thank you. Greg Dandelis is next, and would Hannah Gabrielson please come up? Hi, so I'm Greg Dandelis, and yeah, I'm just gonna echo a lot of what other people have said. Um, yes, toxins are a problem. Yes, habitat restoration is going to be a huge, make a huge difference in the long-term solution. But as you mentioned, you do not have regulatory authority over breaching those dams. You do have regulatory authority over fishing. And as a lot of people have mentioned, um, 
restricting harvest is something you already do. It's something that's proven effective for fish populations around the world. And none of your literature mentions that. No one here has mentioned that. Um, you have taken measures uh, that I think meet some short-term uh, demands, but don't address the long-term. Increasing hatchery output, sure. Short-term, it looks good, but those fish are competing with wild fish. Now we're at a point where only 4% of catches come from the wild. Um, and those hatchery fish, they don't reach full maturity. We've seen uh, historical weights of Chinook salmon go from 25 pounds down to a current seven pounds. So yeah, sure, we'll, re we'll release more hatchery fish, but that's not in the long-term needs of the Chinook salmon, which is in turn not in the long-term needs of the orcas. Um, so I'd just like to see at least, it's a complicated issue, but by talking about how complicated it is, that's often, I mean, that's really, I think, um, an appeal to ignorance, logical fallacy. It's like people talking about yeah. solar flares and yeah. global warming. Okay, sure, habitat restoration is good. Sure, toxins are bad, but come on. We've seen restricting harvest work for other fish populations. I don't see why we're not talking about that here. I think it's in the long-term interest of the fishermen. It's definitely in the short-term and long-term interest of the workers. So I'd like to see more of that conversation happening. Thanks. Hello, I'm Hannah Gabrielson. Um, I'm an underwater photographer and wildlife photographer. And the day before Scarlett went missing, I saw her from the shore and I got to take a picture of her. I had to look at her and know that I was never going to see her again after that. And five minutes after her and her family left, fishermen came in and dropped their lines to fish right where they were at. And it was not illegal. I went to the grocery store the next day and I saw Chinook salmon in the market. We know what the problem is. They're starving to death. And you have the capability to help that. Thank you. Janelle Van Ruten. Okay. And after Janelle is Marguerite uh, P. Papillonen. Hello, my name is, sorry, I'm very tall. Uh, my name is Janelle. I traveled here today from, also from Portland, Oregon, um, because I had to speak up for the southern resident killer whales because I'm tired of seeing them be neglected. Um, the southern resident killer whales have, um, they had 120 members before SeaWorld's capture era in 1965. In 1960, 1976, just 11 years later, the capture era ended and a mere count of 70 orcas remained. It is now 2018 and 74 orcas remain 42 years later. The southern resident population has not been able to come back due to the dwindling salmon populations. Out of the 90 orca that were taken from their home and forced in captivity, only one remains and that's Lolita, who is still at the Miami Seaquarium. We have already allowed the captive industry to ruin the southern resident killer whale population once, and now we are relying on them to rehabilitate our few remaining. SeaWorld has never been able to keep them alive, so what makes you think they will keep them alive now? In 1984, we began taking data on the population of the Chinook salmon. It is clear there's been a steady decline in both the size and number of the salmon returning to both stream and rivers. This has resulted in the endangerment of Chinook salmon species. The orca are starving and they need a healthy salmon population to survive. This is not an issue that we can solve by capturing the orca. How will that bring the salmon back? The management of fisheries will. It's time to stop putting band-aids over the real issues. Noah, you, not, you may not be able to breach the dams, but you do have a position to end fishing of Chinook salmon. And this is our top priority. Thank you. Papionen, are you here? Yeah. Okay, and after her is Curtis Johnson. And I will say we do have some additional um, slots available, so if you would like to speak, you can come up and, and sign up. Thank you. My name is Marguerite Papuano. I'm a veterinary epidemiologist who worked with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention for 24 years, primarily in the areas of global health, and currently at the University of Washington as an affiliate professor with the Center for One Health Research 
looking at the connections between human animals and the environment. I applaud uh, NOAA for all its efforts and in including the work being done for individuals on recovery uh, plans. However, it's very clear that the size of this population is now so small and definitely on the brink of extinction that a population-based approach has to be taken. It comes to mind with task forces and meetings and hearings and research and uh, that we are really getting to that phrase, are we rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic? We need action now. And it's very clear that I've learned through work with animal health and human health that if you don't have nutrition, you don't have anything. And so if they're not eating and getting protein, the contamination, the vessel noise, the ever, all the other factors that go into this complex picture don't matter. If they're not here, we don't have to worry about all those other factors. They have to be here in order to be able to address some of the other actions. So a, a sense of priorities can be taken. So action is needed now, and all of us need to participate. We've got the political will at this point behind the bold action that's going to be needed to get them food and now. <laughs> and then we can kick in and start to address all the other factors. And it's not just for the whales themselves. If we haven't caught on, that biodiversity and the survival of this whale is connected to our own sustainability as humans, then a big picture message has been lost. So uh, thank you, and again, a really a vote for action now. Hi, my name is Curtis Johnson. I write for truthout.org, so I'm a freelance journalist. I'm also a research scientist. I think the things people have said today are really, really important and powerful. These whales have been on the endangered species list since I think it's 2005, is that right? 2005, this is a failure, what's happened. It's a failure of the whales. It's a failure of the wild salmon that's been done. I, I believe you probably do care. I believe you care. But business as usual is not going to get it done. It is not going to get it done. We need to go out. We, we already know what to do. All the things that people have said today are what we need to do. We need to breach these dams on the Snake River. We need to restore wild salmon habitat. We need to address the other issues. We need to shut down fishing. I'm a fisherman. We need to shut down fishing this year, or for as long as it takes. We have to do these things or these whales are going to be gone. We don't have any more time. It's past time for task force, past time for talk. It's action time. You, if you care, you have to stand with us. Not with Trump and the rest of us. You have to stand with us. And we need to fight to make this happen. Because even Governor Inslee, he probably cares too. But he's going along with business as usual, talking to the other stakeholders. Well, it's complicated. What can we really do? We're going to have to force change if we want change. Ken Workman is next, and then Olivia Onefeather, please come up. Ja just uppstid där att det var så att vi gick och att vi gick och så att vi gick och så And this is the native language of the Duwamish people that lived here. And I talk like this because we weren't allowed to speak this way for so very long. And what I just said was, my name is Workman. I am of the Duwamish tribe and great, 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 great grandson of Chief Seattle. Wow. And all. Wow. <laughs> That on the wall, on the walls, this, this thing you call the Sailor Sea, Puget Sound, forever lived the blackfish. Today, there's hardly any. And so while the, the blackfish, they can't talk for themselves, I would like to at least give them a mention that we respect this land. We respect these people that are in the water, these people that you call orca. Kalkalihech is uh, the technical word that we use. Hibacholagu, uh, blackfish. And so I would ask you, and I would ask everyone here, that when you're on this land, you know where you are, that people once lived here. 
and that when you're out there on the watch, that there are people in that water, there are salmon people, there are killer whale people, that you know these people are here, and yet you do whatever you can to help them. As Duwamish people, we recognize all of this stuff that's happening right now to these blackfish. And so I would, I would implore you not to do the same thing to them that has happened to us. Thank you. Hi, I'm Olivia Onefeather of the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe, um, and uh, I felt it in my heart, my soul, to, to come here and speak to you and use my voice. Um, Ken Workman is a, <laughs> I can, how do you follow up after that? That was, <laughs> he's amazing and he is, uh, he is the tribe of these lands and his word should be honored in always, always. Um, it's very, very important. Um, J5. 35 has delivered us a message that couldn't be more clear. These waters must be protected as if you were a mother protecting your own child. Um, the Lummi <coughs> tribe was successful in protecting Cherry Point from the dirty coal industries terminal, which would have been devastating for that population. Um, what, which, which is a great step. We, we, however, really all must go further and do more. Um, you wanted to do an assessment to know what was going on. Um, and my question to you is, are you willing to challenge the real issues at hand? You said you know you need to do more and uh, need to be doing more. And the things, the things that are, they're hard. They're hard and they're, they're big. They're things like volume of the Grand Alliance in the Northwest Seaport that has been bringing in 11% more cargo ships than they were last year. That is having a huge effect on them. These organizations like Amazon and, <laughs> you know, Costco and all your great organizations, your corporations, it always comes back to that. Um, the native people of these lands have been telling you to stop with the destruction of these, of our, of our homelands forever, and I wish they would finally listen. Thank you. Elizabeth Petros is next, and after that is Jesse Schwartz. Please come up. Oh, good, I'm not the last speaker. Mm -hmm. So, my name is Elizabeth. I'm a former fisheries manager, and I want to ask a question. Who has ever commented on regulations presented by the Fishery Management Council? Oh, you have missed a real opportunity, my people. Every February, the council submits a, um, a fishery report. Basically, what do the Chinook numbers look like? What do the salmon numbers look like? As you know, salmon are managed annually. Every year, different numbers come back, and that's identified in a variety of different documents that the Pacific Fishery Management Council develops. I was part of that process for many years. I have sat on salmon technical teams. There are a lot of really smart scientists that are looking at the data, how many fish are coming back, which ESUs, which DPSs, and setting salmon harvest based on that. You all have an opportunity to participate in that. In April, um, at the April Council meeting, they set quotas. They take public comment. The Pacific Council is based on largely on public comment. They ask, they ask for public comment, and I have watched public comment sway regulations. The council doesn't write the regulations, but they re make the recommendations to NIMS. So if you are not taking that opportunity to get your voice heard on what you think needs to happen with fisheries, you're missing a real opportunity because the council does want to hear from you. And the council is the body that NIMS relies on to set fishery numbers, especially the salmon fishery. So everybody in February, go to PC, uh, PSC, uh, Pacific Fishery Management Council, whatever that acronym would be, .org, and you will see the first of a series of reports, and you'll see regulations, you'll see their schedule of when the meetings are happening, and they will listen to you. Thank you. Our, our last comment comes from Jesse Schwartz. How I ended up as the last speaker, I don't know. But I guess I can go over, I don't know, you'll throw something. <laughs> I'm really proud of everybody's comments today. There were a number, number of points that came up that were unexpected. You talked, Scott, in your introductory remarks about silver bullets. I think you've been given some. I would encourage everyone to look at the story of the North Atlantic right whales. 
2030 was a whale that was killed by the disentangler team a long time ago. And it was supposed to be a waterfall moment, right? We've, we've, we've lost a whale. Everybody's going to rise up and above. But half measures in the boat transport system, half measures in the fisheries, half measures in stopping trawling. Today, there's half as many North Atlantic right whales as they were when 2030 died. When I was looking at that problem 20 odd years ago, um, there were more right whale biologists than there were northern right whales. And today, there's about twice as many northern right whale biologists as there are northern right whales. And my point there is, it's not metaphor. Without action, we will lose the pot. End of story. It's not, absolutely, hammer that out. But I mean, literally, without the kind of actions people are talking about, you don't have regulatory authority to breach the dams. You do have regulatory authority to create an emergency moratorium on non-tribal fishery, non fisheries. You do have regulatory authority to petition your federal and state part partners to change the boat traffic lanes to address. You have a lot of regulatory authority and a lot of actions that you can take. So I appreciate everybody's comments there. I want to speak directly to the Sea World issue, and I got 39 seconds to do it. I listened to you speak, Lynn, and this is what you said to me. This is what I heard. It was never our intention to capture that whale to put it into captivity. You also said. You have a pen, and you would really want to avoid ever keeping that whale, that whale in captivity. But what you and I know, some of you may not, is that the way this works is this. Once the whale is in captivity, if you develop scientific consensus that it cannot be safely released to the wild, you're able to write an exception to the Mailman Protection Act, and that whale can go to SeaWorld or to an aquarium. So my, that, those are the facts. That's how the Marine, Life, you know, Marine Mammal Protection Acts work. That's how the, the statutory authority works, that you can take that well then and put it in captivity. So my recommendation is, my request would be, my demand for the people to rally around would be, you don't capture a well until you can guarantee it doesn't go into captivity. Um, I, I gave the opportunity in our last call for people to sign up. If you would like to sign up now, I can let you speak. Um, this is the last call. Yes. <laughs> Just to be clear, with anybody else, this is the last call if you want to come up. There's a lot going on and it's, you know, everybody's what, refugees. Or sure, what is your name and I'll get My you name done. is Jessica James. Jessica James, okay. It's James, like a girl's name. J-N-E-S. Yes. Very good. Correct. <laughs> Okay, so I'm sorry that I'm late to sign up to speak. I moved here from Florida across the United States. I grew up as a kid going to SeaWorld. I worked at an aquarium. I've done public education. I've also uh, worked as a vet tech. I'm a marine scientist. I feel that the problem that we have at this time is conservation. We are not protecting the land and the animals that need the, our protection. They don't have a voice. We are the voice for these animals. If we don't do something to breach these dams, to help these animals, they are gonna die, period. It is what it is. Just like when you go and you try to cull another species to protect one species, that is not the correct action to take. You're gonna take out something that is vital in, a, in a, an ecosystem that is needed in that ecosystem. It is a very important part of the ecosystem and ecosystems collapse when you take these animals out of them. So my opinion as working at an aquarium, as doing public ed education, as doing rescue, rehab and release, I know that a lot of people are against SeaWorld and they're against aquariums, but the research that is done at them is vital. Whether people agree with them being in captivity or not, if this research was not done, these animals would die. I worked with, at the Georgia Aquarium in, Flo in Florida doing conservation stranding on North, Amer uh, North Atlantic dolphin species. I used to go out on stranding response when there was a UME, when the animals died. I had to do necropsies on these deceased animals because of the contaminations that are in the water. If we as people do not help our ecosystems, the animals, the people, the environment will die. We are needed to take action for our ecosystem, for our children, for the world. Uh -huh. Aho. <laughs> we have two more speakers, and I will close it after these two speakers, uh, Shanna Kelly and then Chris Sanjala. We go from tall to short. <laughs> so my name is Shauna Kelly, and I was hoping someone from Dam Sense would be here, but um, 
I'm going to represent as best as I can. So at a meeting the other day, the Orca Summit, um, we heard some really good data. And on the new information sheet that you guys had submitted on August 31st on page two, you misrepresented the Chinook, sorry, I'm so nervous, <laughs> the Chinook data that was six years old and off by 50,000. And so please check out DamSense. It's a wonderful site. Um, we need to get out the real data. We need to share, and we can't have any more misrepresentations anymore. Um, the most effective and efficient way that's been studied for 25 years is to breach the lower four. Economically, it's sound in the whole state. It prospers all of us. And we're ready to do it. We don't need congressional approval. We just need Inslee to do it. And it's already done. They already have the plans to breach. They've been researching this for so long. It's all in line. We just need the go. Thank you. Chris Sanjal is our last comment. Hi, my name is Chris Sorelia. Um, I don't really know uh, much what has been done for organizing people to respond to the needs, but I think it'd be a shame for all of us to leave today without some kind of system in place, and maybe we need to step outside of the building um, to start collecting email addresses and make some plans, but um, personally, I, I feel like I want to leave with some kind of activity and response and not just um, having listened in and spoken tonight. So I have a tablet. Um, I don't have a, I'm not a techie uh, and I don't have uh, a expertise in this field, but I'd, I'd really like to join some kind of an effort to, um, you know, change the, Chinook consumption to work on dam removal and, and these other topics that have been brought up. Let's, let's leave with something productive today. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, Scott Rumsey has a few closing remarks. Well, thank you all. I, I genuinely and sincerely appreciate uh, all the perspectives that were voiced today. And, and again, I really appreciate that you all came here uh, to speak your mind, to give us your perspectives, to voice the incredible passion we have in this room and our communities to recover, to recover killer whales. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful of that. You know, I heard, we all heard a lot of, of, of priorities today and we need to restore the ecosystem. It's about habitat, it's about uh, restoring our salmon prey. Um, you know, I, I hear uh, the direction that we need to think outside of the box because the status quo is not working. Um, heard the message loud and clear about harvest restrictions and, and sanctuary. Um, and, uh, and I recognize also this frustration with bureaucracy um, you know, I hear a lack of trust with NOAA. Um, you know, I, I definitely, I, I don't like hearing that. That um, disappoints me. The only way we can improve that trust is for you folks to engage and for us to listen and for us to develop these relationships so that we can have this exchange. Um, and so I want to build that trust. I promise to you now that I am I'm here because I care, um, and I want to hear you, and I want to build that trust. Um, I was I was touched by Michelle McClellan's uh, talk that you know this is really personal, and it is really personal. I mean, for some of us, it's our jobs. Um, you know, I have a 13-year-old daughter at home. When she was four, we went to the San Juans and went to the Whale Museum, and. You know, she walked out with a couple stuffed animals, and she still has her mommy and baby stuffed animal on her bed that she sleeps with. And um, while I, through my job, am committed to salmon recovery and killer whale recovery, I also have to go to her and answer to her every night. Um, and she is as concerned as all of you about killer whales, and that we, um, 
you know, break the log jam and, and, and make real progress. Um, so uh, I thank you again for coming. Um, please know that you are heard. Uh, please hear that call to action. You know, individually, uh, we all have a lot we can do, and I hope you feel empowered to engage in the processes, educate those around you in your communities. That's equally as important as a lot of these other solutions that we've talked about. It, it is, it is going to take a whole village. Um, so uh, thank you again for coming. Um, I'll hang here for as long as I can to talk with you individually. Thanks. So thank you all for coming. I just want to point out if we will be continuing to communicate about what we're doing on behalf of the killer whales. These are the channels by which we share that information, so please follow us and, and continue the dialogue. Thank you for coming this afternoon.